Hi everyone, my name is Reagan. I'm a fourth year on an appy rotation with Dr. Crutchley, and I'm going to be doing the second half of today's lecture about gene environment interactions. These are the objectives for today. By the end of the lecture, you should be able to define gene environment interactions and describe some clinically relevant examples of gene environment interactions. I also want to acknowledge a speaker from the 2012 Genetics and Human Complexes course at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Some of these slides have been adapted from that speaker for this lecture. We'll start with the first objective, which is to define gene environment interactions. Then later I'll go more in depth through some specific examples that have been described in literature. A gene environment interaction, or GXE, is when a person's genotype affects their response to an environmental factor. This graph is an illustration of what this might look like. Each line within the graph represents a genotype. We have genotypes A, B, and C. The x-axis represents exposure to some environmental factor, and the y-axis represents the response. You'll see this called the phenotype, or we're going to refer to it as the outcome. It's whatever we're using to measure each genotype's response to the environmental factor. A well-known example of a GXE is ALDH2 deficiency. ALDH2 is the enzyme that breaks down acetaldehyde, which is one of the metabolites of ethanol. About 50% of individuals of East Asian descent carry at least one reduced function allele of the ALDH2 gene, meaning when they consume alcohol, acetaldehyde builds up because they're deficient in the enzyme that clears it. This causes unpleasant effects like flushing, nausea, and headaches. Looking at this graph in the context of ALDH2 deficiency, the x-axis will be alcohol consumption and the y-axis will be unpleasant side effects like flushing and nausea. Genotype A would be someone who is homozygous for ALDH2 loss of function alleles. They're pretty sensitive to the unpleasant effects of alcohol. As soon as they start drinking, they have those effects. Genotype B could be someone who is heterozygous with one ALDH2 loss of function allele and one normal function allele. They get a little bit of flushing and nausea, especially if they drink a lot, but they're not as sensitive as someone who is homozygous for loss of function alleles. Genotype C would be someone with two normal function alleles, and they're not sensitive at all to the flushing reaction because their body is really efficient at breaking down acetaldehyde. One of the things I'm going to focus on during this lecture is for each example of a GXC, I'm going to identify a genetic factor, an environmental factor, and an outcome. So for this example, our gene is ALDH2, our environmental exposure is alcohol consumption, and our outcome is a flushing reaction. Now we're going to take a look at a few different ways a gene environment interaction can modify the effect an environmental exposure has on our outcome. For the next few slides, we're going to use a made up example using a gene with an A allele and a T allele. Our environmental factor is going to be activity level and our outcome is going to be BMI. This graph is similar to the one on the previous slide, just in 3D. Our x-axis shows three different genotypes, homozygous T, heterozygous AT, and homozygous A, and our outcome is BMI, which you can see on the y-axis. The three bars closer to us represent the average BMI of each genotype if they have a high activity level, if they exercise a lot. You can see that in this theoretical example, active individuals on average have the same BMI regardless of their genotype. The three bars further back represent the average BMI of each genotype if they're sedentary. You can see that in sedentary individuals, homozygous for the T allele, BMI increases only slightly from that of active individuals, whereas individuals who are heterozygous AT have a higher risk of weight gain, and those who are homozygous for the A allele have the highest risk of weight gain with a sedentary lifestyle. This data is suggesting that individuals with the A allele are more sensitive to weight gain from a sedentary lifestyle, and this effect increases as the number of copies of the A allele increases. This example is very similar. Once again, we're looking at the same gene, environmental factor, and outcome. But this data suggests that individuals with the A allele tend to gain weight more easily regardless of activity level. This effect is more apparent in sedentary individuals. So we can say that based on this data, the A allele is associated with higher BMI in all patients, but sedentary individuals are more sensitive to this effect. Finally, in this last example, you can see that the A allele appears to have a strong association with elevated BMI in sedentary patients, but in active patients, the association flips, and the T allele appears to be strongly associated with elevated BMI. These last three slides were just to show what kind of effects we can see from gene environment interactions. There won't be anything like this on the exam, it's just to help illustrate the concept. Next, I want to think about what each part of a gene environment interaction, the genetic factor, environmental factor, and outcome can look like. 
The genetic factor will be genotype, either of a specific gene or maybe a group of genes that are related. The environmental factor could be exposure to a drug, either a prescription or non-prescription, exposure to a toxin like air pollution, exposure to a lifestyle factor such as dietary habits, exercise habits, or sleep habits, or it could be exposure to stress, either a single traumatic event or chronic stress. The outcome is going to be what we're using to measure the effect of the environmental exposure on the individual. That could be change in a physical trait such as BMI. So for example, some variants in the FTO gene have been associated with greater sensitivity to environmental factors that can cause weight gain. Somebody who carries high risk FTO alleles might be more prone to weight gain from a poor diet or sedentary lifestyle. So for that example, our gene is high risk FTO allele, our environmental factor is lifestyle, and our outcome is BMI. Another outcome we might look at would be the therapeutic efficacy of a drug. A good example of this would be warfarin and v c one Polymorphisms in v c one which encodes the enzyme that warfarin inhibits, affect how sensitive somebody is to warfarin. So the warfarin dose they need to maintain their INR at their goal range might change. So in this example, our gene is v c one our environmental factor is exposure to warfarin, and our outcome is INR. We also might look at adverse effects of a drug. For example, carbamazepine has been implicated in causing skin reactions such as SJS in 10. Individuals who are HLA B star 1502 positive are at greater risk of developing these reactions from carbamazepine. In this example, our gene is HLA B star 1502. Our environmental factor is carbamazepine exposure and our outcome is SJS in 10 risk. Another outcome might be susceptibility to a disease state. For example, variants in the APOE gene, which encodes for APOE, an enzyme that helps regulate blood lipids, have been associated with a higher risk of Parkinson's disease in elderly patients who suffer from depression, particularly with sleep disturbance. In this example, our gene is APOE variant, our environmental factor is mood and sleep dysregulation, and our outcome is Parkinson's disease. This slide is intended to emphasize the different parts of a gene-environment interaction, the genotype, environmental exposure, and outcome, and give examples of some of the things we might be looking at for an outcome. You don't need to remember the examples I give here, uh, but each example is in the notes section of the PowerPoint if you want to look through them again. So why should we study gene-environment interactions? GXE might help us unmask associations present only in certain environments or genotypes. So for example, identifying certain genotypes that are less likely to respond to a medication. It can help us identify genetically susceptible individuals who might benefit from certain lifestyle changes. So a good example would be personalized diet recommendations. It can help us gain insight into the biological mechanisms of a disease or trait. And it can also help us account for the missing heritability of a disease or trait. The missing heritability problem describes the fact that simple, single genetic variations don't completely account for the heritability of diseases and other phenotypes. We're missing the full answer to the heritability because there's so many things contributing. Studying GXE can help us uncover more of that answer. Now we're going to go more in depth into a few clinical examples of gene environment interactions that have been described in literature. We have three examples. For each, I'll go through a slide with some background information, then I'll give a brief, sum brief summary of the study, and then an outline of the possible gene environment interaction. Our first example involves the hormone GLP-1. GLP-1 is secreted in response to food entering the small intestine. It agonizes GLP-1 receptors to stimulate insulin secretion. GLP-1 is inactivated by the enzyme DPP-4. So in patients with diabetes, we use drugs that are DPP-4 inhibitors, such as citagliptin and linagliptin, to prevent degradation of GLP-1 and increase GLP-1-mediated insulin secretion. The gene GLP-1R encodes the GLP-1 receptor. The A allele of the polymorphism that RS number and the second bullet is referring to has been associated with enhanced response to GLP-1 receptor agonism. So GLP-1 signaling stimulates more insulin secretion. This figure is from a 2016 study that took 246 patients with uncontrolled type 2 diabetes and treated them with a DPP-4 inhibitor for 24 weeks. All patients were genotyped prior to enrollment for the GLP-1R polymorphism described on the last slide. The primary outcome was the portion of patients who were carriers of the A allele and the portion of patients who were non-carriers who responded to treatment with the DPP-4 inhibitor.
Response was defined as an A1C reduction of 10% or greater at the end of the 24 weeks of treatment. At the end of the study, investigators found that patients who carried the A allele were significantly more likely to respond to the DPP-4 inhibitor, but only in the subset of patients whose baseline A1C at the beginning of the study was greater than 8%. So for this gene-environment interaction, our gene was that GLP-1R polymorphism, the environmental exposure was treatment with a DPP-4 inhibitor, and our outcome was A1C. The summary of this GXE is that in patients with baseline A1C greater than 8%, carriers of the A allele are significantly more likely to achieve a 10% reduction in A1C following 24 weeks of treatment with a DPP-4 inhibitor. A clinical implication of this is that GLP-1R genotyping could indicate whether or not a DPP-4 inhibitor is likely to be therapeutically effective for a patient. DPP-4 inhibitors are all brand name only still, so they're pretty expensive. It would be nice to have an idea of how likely a patient is to benefit from the drug before we spend the money on it, especially because we have a lot of alternative options for diabetes treatments. Our second example involves post-traumatic stress disorder and the gene ADRB2, which encodes for the beta-2 receptor. Part of the pathology of PTSD includes dysregulated fear conditioning following trauma. When an individual experiences trauma, their brain becomes conditioned to associate stimuli like sights and sounds that remind them of the trauma with the fear and other negative emotions they experienced. To a certain extent, this is normal. It helps us remember and avoid things that we found threatening. In someone with PTSD, their brain does something called overgeneralizing and starts to associate so many different stimuli with the trauma that the conditioned fear response becomes pathologic and disruptive to their everyday life. Because their brain is constantly reminding itself of their trauma, they end up stuck in the sympathetic fight or flight mode, which is what the figure on this slide is showing. Beta-2 adrenergic receptors in the brain are involved in fear conditioning and development of fear associations. So it makes sense that they could be involved in the pathology of PTSD. This figure is from a 2014 study. The data represented in the left graph came from a cohort of about 700 Ohio National Guard members, primarily Caucasian males, and assessed them for exposure to childhood trauma prior to deployment. Over the next three years, they were assessed annually for PTSD symptoms. Investigators found that among members who had experienced two or more types of childhood trauma, those who were carriers of the G allele of the ADRB2 SNP on the last slide had a significantly higher severity of PTSD symptoms following deployment. On the graph, the x-axis represents the number of types of childhood trauma the person experienced, and the y-axis represents the severity of PTSD symptoms. You can see that there was no difference in PTSD symptoms between any of the genotypes in those who experienced zero or one type of childhood adversity. But among those who experienced two or more types of childhood adversity, the more copies of the G allele the group carried, the more severe their PTSD symptoms were. What's cool about this study is they replicated the results in another demographic. The data represented in the right graph came from a retrospective cohort study of about 2,000 trauma-exposed persons who were primarily African-American females. They were assessed for exposure to childhood trauma and PTSD symptoms in a similar way to the discovery cohort, and investigators found the same association. Among those who experienced two or more types of childhood trauma, carrying the G allele was associated with more severe PTSD symptoms, with that effect increasing with the number of G alleles a person carried. For this gene-environment interaction, the gene was ADRB2, the environmental factor was exposure to childhood trauma, and the outcome was adult PTSD symptoms. So in summary, in patients with exposure to two or more types of childhood trauma, carriers of the G allele had more severe PTSD symptoms, with that effect increasing as the number of G alleles the person carried increased. Clinically, knowing this association exists gives us information about the beta-2 receptor and its role in fear conditioning and the pathology of PTSD. It could also point us towards some possible treatments. So for example, propranolol is a non-selective beta blocker that's fairly lipophilic, which means it can cross the blood-brain barrier. It's already used off-label for anxiety sometimes, so maybe it could play a role in preventing or treating PTSD. Our last example involves a hypothesized autoimmune mechanism of schizophrenia. I'll briefly review autoimmunity just for some context. HLA proteins on cell surfaces regulate the immune system by helping immune cells differentiate between cells that are self and cells that are non-self. That's what this picture is showing. On the left, you see the immune cell doing what it's supposed to be doing and recognizing the non-self cell. On the right, you see the immune cell inappropriately targeting the self cell and triggering production of autoantibodies.
Genes that encode for HLA proteins are inherited as haplotypes or groups of alleles, one from each parent. To date, there have been almost 29,000 individual HLA alleles identified. Certain HLA haplotypes have been associated with a higher incidence of autoimmune diseases. This figure is from an article in which the authors propose a process by which gut dysbiosis, or imbalance in the gut microbiome, might be associated with development of schizophrenia. Possible causes of gut dysbiosis include GI pathogens, diet, medications, and maternal exposure. In this proposed process, gut dysbiosis causes systemic inflammation, which increases the permeability of the gut blood and blood brain barriers. This allows microbes from the gut to enter circulation and then cross into the brain. Your immune system then mobilizes an immune response to the brain to eliminate these microbes, and this immune response puts a bunch of immune cells in close proximity with the neurons and synapses in your brain. The authors postulate that with certain HLA haplotypes, this might trigger autoimmune destruction of certain neuronal synapses, leading to symptoms of schizophrenia. There is evidence that people with schizophrenia suffer from autoimmune diseases at a higher rate than the general population, which suggests schizophrenia might be linked to autoimmunity. So for this last example, our gene is HLA haplotype, the environmental factor is gut dysbiosis, and the outcome is development of schizophrenia. And summarized below is an outline of the proposed process that I just described on the last slide. In summary, there are numerous non-genetic factors, including intrinsic and extrinsic factors that can affect drug metabolism. That's referencing the first part of this lecture that Dr. Crutchley reported. Genetic and environmental factors should both be considered when evaluating outcomes of interest, such as treatment outcomes for different diseases, because oftentimes they're both important and potentially linked. And modification of drug therapy can be achieved by continuous observation of patients. So that's all I have for this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, or I'm sure Dr. Crutchley would also be happy to take questions. And we'll see you in class next week.